We are finishing up Genesis. We did it. Amen. The funny thing, there's lots of different ways to organize a sermon. Every once in a while, I think I've only done it maybe twice, you guys have seen me play the part of a character. That's a unique one. That doesn't happen very often. Sometimes I do what I did last week where it's like five chapters of stuff all in one sermon, and it kind of gets filtered down into some points. Today is one of my favorite ways of preaching a sermon, and it's kind of funny that last week we covered five chapters. Today we're covering one verse. Very different. Now, the reason that I'm okay with covering one verse is because this verse, which you just heard me read, is the summary. It's not only Joseph's summary of his life. If, if you were to ask Joseph at the end of his life, uh, in one sentence, how could you describe your life story? He would choose this. But also, if you chose the, if you asked the author of Genesis, in one sentence, if we had to, to get a feeling of Joseph, what would you tell us? He would choose this sentence. So, in a way, I'm only talking about one verse, but I'm actually, it's a summary verse. I want us to push ourselves into this. I'm going to read it. If you are taking notes, this is the um, outline, the bullet points of your notes. Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. We're going to break that down into point one, you intended to harm me. Point two, but. Point three, God intended it for good. Point four, to accomplish what is now being done. Point six, the saving of many lives. Point one, you intended to harm me. Intend. Seems to me, Joseph, that it happened. Intend, or if you're in the ESV, it says, you meant to harm me. It has this feeling of you tried and failed, or you, you had this, this bubbling up, but it didn't actually happen. It really happened, though, didn't it? Didn't they really harm him? Chapter 37, verse 24, they actually threw him into the cistern. They didn't just intend to. They followed through. Chapter 37, verse 28, they actually sold him. They didn't just intend to harm him. They harmed him. They actually sold him. Verse 32, they did, they did not just intend to fake his death to his own dad. They did it. Why does he say intend? Because intention hurts. Wouldn't have been so bad if it was all on accident. He's saying to his own brothers, it's not just that you did it, you wanted to do it. You ever have something that happens to you and you, re you feel bad that it happened, but then you realize that somebody did it on purpose, it hurts even more. It's like, man, you did it on, you, you actually plotted that out. That's what he's getting at. You ever feel this way? You intended to harm me. You ever feel that from Joseph? Like you could just stand back and look at a few places in life and, and you could either say to a person or to a group of people or to a situation, you intend to harm me. You're not for me. And sometimes this can be silly, like Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. You intended to harm me. You put gum in my hair, and I was just trying to have a good day. It's funny to me that when I've read that story to my kids, he wants to escape by going to Australia, which means he doesn't know a lot about Australia. <laughs> Do you know there are 66 poisonous animals in Australia? 
There are animals in Australia that exist everywhere else in the world without poison, but because of the shifting of Australia, it actually, that same animal has venom in Australia. Alexander doesn't know much about Australia. And some of us, it's not a funny, you intended to harm me, like Alexander and the Terrible Horrible. It's a like Australia, like I'm on an island and everything's trying to kill me, kind of, you intended to harm me. This is, this is coming right out of Genesis 3, by the way. It's totally appropriate if you're seeing this good and harm here at the end and the intentions of the human heart versus the intentions of God's heart, and you start to reflect back on Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and you think about how everything broke. All, it wasn't just, you hurt me, as he says to Adam and Eve, you broke our relationship, and so we're strained. The penalty of the broken relationship with the Creator is a broken creation. Everything is cursed. And so, in a way, everything's out to get you. Romans 8.20 says, creation is subject to frustration. It says again and again, it's groaning, it's groaning, it's groaning. Even if the Spirit of God is in you, you're groaning for something. Why? Because the world intends to harm you. Would you ever say that back to your former self even? You look back 10 years ago and you could, if you could look through a magic mirror and reach and wring yourself by the neck and say, you intended to harm me pull it together. Don't do what you're getting ready to do. I think we can stand with Joseph in a lot of ways. If we, if we push ourselves into chapter 50, verse 20, and just broaden that out, you intended to harm me. As a result of the fall, every human life is under the intention of harm. But, that's his next word. But, now, Joseph can he can say this, and he also can't say this. He can't say but because he doesn't know what's happening. At the beginning of the story, Joseph cannot interject because he doesn't know how it's going to happen. Harm was intended to him. My brothers want to put me in a cistern. They want to sell me, and they want to tell my dad I'm dead. Everything's falling apart. He can't say but because he doesn't know what God's going to do. I don't know what's happening in your life right now. I don't know what your harm is. I don't know where you might point and say, this harm is intended to me. But you don't know what God is going to do. And so for that reason, because you don't know the what, you can't say but. All you can say is, you intended to harm me, period. I don't know what God's going to do with it. Now, if we change it, and we say, it's not about the what, it's about the weather. You may not know what God is going to do, but do you know whether He's going to do it? Yes. Now you can say, but. You intended to harm me, and if the question is whether God is going to bring it into goodness, but, next part of the story, I get to move on. What does that mean for your life? It means that there's hope in the hospital. It means that there is the possibility of joy in your suffering. It means that when bad things happen, it's not all bad. And even if you don't know the what, you know the weather. I don't know what God is going to do with my mess. But if you ask me whether He's going to turn the mess into good, absolutely. Amen. I'm just waiting to see. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Now, shouldn't this be phrased differently? You intended up, but God intended down. You intended right, but God intended left. Shouldn't it be like that? So if it's like that, it should be, you intended to harm me, but God intended to do good. Or you intended to harm me, but God intended to help me. That's not how he writes it. See, when you read Scripture, take your time. Look at this. There's a reason that the author has phrased it just this way. It. 
Now, I don't want to make you feel by what I'm getting ready to say, like there's a bunch of secret words in the Bible and you have to find them if you're going to be a real scholar. But I will tell you that that word it right there is now Pastor Nathan's favorite word in the Bible. I'm making an official announcement. I'm going to explain to you why the word it in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 is my favorite word. And it's the word I'm speaking over your life. Because if all it is, is you intended to harm me, but God intended to help me, then what that means is I've got people who want to hurt me and I've got people who want to help me. And let's see who's going to win. No, uh, uh, uh. that's not what it says. It says, but God intended it. What is it? It is the intention of harm. Rephrase the sentence. God intended your intention of harm for good. The very stuff that's wrong, that's the material that God is using to bring you good. That means it's not him, it's not just good versus evil. It's a dominant good that stands in your life saying, let's see what wrong happens, watch what I'm going to use it for. It's not just a good that tries to be more than 50% saying you're going to have 49% evil and I'm going to try to overwhelm it with my divine power and give you 51% good. No, it's saying let's see what's going to happen. It doesn't matter what happens in your life. Could be 99% evil. Could be enormous amounts of pain and suffering and regret and bitterness and brokenness. And what God does is he says, that's your it. I intend it for good. Watch what I do with your story. That's what God says. If the things that happened to Joseph didn't happen to Joseph, God doesn't do with Joseph what he did with Joseph. And we don't have this story. It. The love of God has the power to make bad things into good things. How does he do it? I'm going to give you four ways that God takes care of the it, but he needs the it in your life. He needs it to happen. When you give your life to Christ, He does not pretend that you haven't been through things or that you're not going to go through things. He just says, give Him your things so He can make you a new thing. Then the old thing you've been through becomes your story. How does He do it? Number one, reconnection. All the places in your life that feel broken and separated, you can't go back there anymore, you can't speak there anymore, you can't do this anymore, you have been broken and separated. God is a reconnector. Two of my favorite reconnections are scars and wood glue. You know why? Because a scar is stronger than skin. And wood glue is stronger than wood. You, try, you wood glue something the right way, if you try to pull that apart, you will tear the fabric of the wood before you will break the wood glue. The scar itself is stronger than the skin. The places in your life that are broken, God wants to repair them in such a way that they aren't just a little bit repaired but still sensitive. They become the strongest part of your life. You hold that out and you show people and you say, this is the place I was broken. This is the place I'm the strongest. You can't do that. That's what God wants to do. He wants to take your it. You intended to do me harm. I gave it to God. He used the very thing to fabric it back together. And now the thing that was once disconnected is now my strongest strength. I put it before you as my testimony. Number two is testimony. Number two is testimony. Church, don't hide your story. Don't hide your story. The longer that I've been here and I've been your pastor, I'm learning who is talking and who's not talking. If God has done a work in your life, that is your testimony. We talked last week about succeeding in private and failing in public. Why? Because when you succeed in private, you're proving integrity. When you fail in public, you're proving trust. And that is the testimony. I don't need to come out here and just shout, look at me, look at me, look at me. The look at me, that's my private success. That means that when nobody's watching, I'm winning. 
When I'm struggling, I struggle out here. Why? Because I want to show you the ways that he is fixing my intended harm. Everything was trying to beat me and to crush me, and the very places that I was losing, God used that as the material to write my new story. I testify. What happens when you do that? You offer the option to others. You know how many times that I hear one person here saying, I'm struggling with this. This is in the confidentiality of a pastoral relationship. I'm struggling with this, and I just don't know how to get through it, and I've been in this place, and, and I really, I just need to get over it. And then five seconds later, somebody else, they've never met each other, we go to the same church. I just wish that I knew how to get through this part of life, and, and they're describing the same exact battle. All the enemy wants to do is make you think you're the only one going through it. A testimony, a testimony is a public proof that God does what he says he does. Third is experience. That's faith muscle building. Why did I go through that thing? This you intended to harm me. I know my story. I know my past. I know my decisions. Why did all that have to happen? Guys, I'm sorry that it happened. If it's your fault, I'm sorry you did it. But when God turns the you intended to harm me into a new story, he does not throw this in the recycle bin. This becomes experience. And there are people who are still in this who need your experience. God doesn't waste time. Last is joy. God does not want you to shuffle your feet into victory. If you have lived a life of bondage to anything, then when God intends it for good, He intends you to be happy about that. Are you happy about that? Do you have a lighthearted joy an excitement? If you lived a certain way and you're not anymore, then stop beating yourself up about it. Be excited about today because the things that were intended for harm, God now intends for good. Move into the new chapter and live in joy, weightless joy because your price has been paid. God did everything that is needed and wants to invite you into a new chapter. Amen. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Why? To accomplish what is now being done. Intended in the beginning. You intended. Is that past tense? Yes. You intended past tense to harm me, but God intended it for good past tense. Now Joseph switches to the present tense to accomplish what is now being done. How often do you pause and reflect on the ways that God has shaped your story? Stuff's happened. There's a lot of it stuff has happened. What about today? Do you enjoy today? What's happening today? What is God doing right now? What opportunities might you have in the next 60 seconds that you could potentially miss out on because of the burden of yesterday? Eyes on, oh, this is me, this is me, this is me. That's past. God wants to bring you into now to accomplish what is now being done. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, always be ready. This is an instruction to Christian people. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the hope that you have. Now, some of us walk around thinking, always be ready to explain the mistakes that you've made. We all make mistakes. Ask about hope. I see who you used to be. I see who you are. Always be ready to give an explanation to anybody who asks about the hope that you have. Can you do that? Now, this is a check the box moment. Pastor's asking you. If someone were to come to you right now, I'm talking to each one of you, think in your mind. Someone walks up to me. They say, you don't seem like you're the same. Something has happened in your life. You seem like there's a light. It seems like there's a light that's been turned on. Seem like there's a hope in your life. 
where did that come from? That's what Peter is saying. Be ready to answer that question. Boy, is that not optimistic? It's not saying that we haven't been anywhere. The very presence of hope means that there was darkness. Peter's saying, I know you've been in dark places, but there's hope in front of you. Where did you get the hope? Be ready to answer the question. I I have met a lot of people who were born and raised in the church. I'm one of them, and I'm going to diagnose them today. You ready to be diagnosed? You've been in the church your whole life? Here's the diagnosis. It's called WTD. I just, I just invented this disease, and I think that, that some people who were born into Christian homes have lived a pretty good life, went to Sunday school, and they have, this is the WTD. It's called weak testimony disorder. And we love to bring in people who do not have weak testimony disorder to tell us their story. Woo, tell us what you've been through. And then we sit there thinking, well, I have heard people say this. People who are saved by the blood of Jesus, who have been exposed to the glory of God, who have eternity in their future saying, hey, I just, you know, I really just didn't stray that far. I just don't have much of a testimony. What? I think you need to return to the light, my friend. Return to the light, be exposed to the glory of God, look back on your past and ask and tell yourself, was your sin all that bad? Your story is a good one. This whole idea of who has a good testimony, either sin is sin or sin is not sin. If we were all falling short of the glory of God, then anybody who raises their hand and says, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus, you do not have a bad testimony. Let us be delivered from weak testimony disorder. If you're saved, you got a testimony. It's from death to life. It says, I was intended harm, but God intended it. He actually used it to write my good. That's my story. I don't have a weak testimony. I've got a transformation in my life. You want to see it? It looks like joy. It looks like hope. And I'm ready to tell you where it came from. The progress you have seen in your life is proof of God's masterful authorship. Now here, let me blow your mind for a second here. The promise you can't see is proof of God's masterful authorship. There is things, there are things happening in your life right now that you can't see. You'll never see them. And it's proof too. If you look right now and you were just to say, I am blessed beyond measure. I was here and now I'm here. Look, my life is proof of a story. I'm here to tell you, and I'm going to give you scriptural truth, that there's more to your life than your life. Your story is bigger than your story. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of our favorites. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Now, we take that as that's a blessing over my life today. That way of living says that whatever happens from the moment that I'm born until the moment I die, that is the testimony that I get to offer because I know that God doesn't have plans to harm me. He has plans to prosper me, right? That means that every day that I live, that's my contribution to the kingdom. No, it's bigger than that. Put the verse in context. Back up one sentence. This is, every, this is the sentence that everybody forgets. 29.10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have to you, declares the Lord. He's speaking to an entire generation, telling them, you will be in Babylon for 70 years. But don't worry, that Life, entire life that you're going to live there, it's going to mean something later. You may not know it, but your life is going to contribute to a greater story. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, even though you yourself are going to live in Babylon. I don't know where you are in life right now, but I know that even one of our favorite verses is saying, you might not experience all of the blessing that your life will contribute to the kingdom. You're going to get some of it. God doesn't want you to go through your entire life just suffering and muddling and uh, dragging your feet. This is tough. He wants you to experience hope and joy. What does this verse mean? Your contribution of a faithful life will be bigger than anything you can experience. 
Paul says it again in Romans. Romans 8.28, we love this one too. Many of us have memorized this one. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Anybody ever heard that verse before? What does all things mean? It feels good. My life, I want my life to be a, a great, I want to feel the goodness of God. I want everything to matter. So we memorize this. I know that God works through all things. What is all things? Read it in context. You back up to verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Everything that comes after that is in the context of the present sufferings. Paul is writing to a church who is struggling, who is fighting against the world that's intending to harm. And he's saying, listen, I know this doesn't feel great that there's stuff that's against you, but just so that you know, he will use all things. What are you in the middle of? And you're wondering, is this a waste of my time? What is happening? Is the goodness and value of my life only from my birth to my death? No. A faithful life is worth more than a faithful life. It is a contribution to the kingdom. You are living with the potential for an immense, larger-than-life size life. The goodness of all that is now being done through your life is unfathomable. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. Last statement. He doesn't need to say this, guys. It's a, he could have just said to accomplish what's now being done and left it to our imaginations, but he says, the saving of many lives. Now put that into context. The saving of many lives? What have you been through, Joseph? This is his statement about his life. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You intended to harm me. Isn't this between the two of them? Isn't this between him and his brothers? So if he's saying that in our relationship you have tried to hurt me, you tried to hurt me, then shouldn't the fixing of it, the result of it, today's value of it, shouldn't it be about their relationship? Shouldn't it be, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the fulfillment of all my dreams. Remember how he told his brothers his dreams and they, it offended them. So shouldn't this be the redemption of his dreams? Or shouldn't it say, the reuniting of my family, what's being accomplished today? Or what's being accomplished today? The respect of my leadership gift. That's what they hurt. That's what they intended harm against. He doesn't mention that either. Shouldn't it be the freedom from prison? Remember how he ended up in prison? Shouldn't it be that what's being accomplished today, even though in, they intended him harm and God wanted it for good, and what's being accomplished today is, look, I got out of prison. Nope, he doesn't mention that either. Shouldn't it be the restoration of my reputation? Nope, he doesn't mention his reputation at all. Out of all the things that he could mention between you and me, he mentions the saving of others. Oh, my goodness gracious. Joseph could have chosen any of those. Pain is what he has experienced, and pain has a way of shrinking our perspective. He has experienced pain in his life. I'm patting Joseph on the back big right now. I want you to do it with me. Joseph has every right to be narrowly focused on his pain. This is how I was hurt. You hurt me in that way, but God fixed it. And now look, I don't feel it anymore. But that's not what he says. Pain has a way of shrinking our perspective so that we can only see the pain. I was playing basketball. I won't mention him by name, but he's a very athletic African man who undercut me. And I went, felt like a sack of potatoes. And I reached back to grab my 
self and what happens when you reach back like this when you're falling? I fell like this and I broke my elbow. And because it was all men on the court and I'm dumb, I said I'm fine and I kept playing. And I tried to dribble and I tried to shoot and all I can think is, ah, don't show anybody how bad it hurts. Until somebody, those of you who play basketball know that when somebody comes up against you, sometimes you'll put your arm against them like this. When I put my arm like that and the pressure came here, oh, 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 okay, I'm done. I'm out. And I walked home and my arm was just, and for days I just, I couldn't think about anything. If we watched a movie, I wasn't watching a movie, I was thinking about my elbow. And if I was eating, I wasn't eating, I was thinking about my elbow. And some of you have been in places where the pain that has been experienced in your life is consuming. And all you can think about, all of life just gets shrunk down to this pain. That is, I'm looking right at it. That is what was done to me. And that is what God's taken me out of. And it was intending me for harm. This thing right here, it hurts so bad. And I'm going to fix it. God's going to fix it in me. And what's being done, he's accomplishing it now for this. I'm going to fix this. And my whole life is now wrapped around the pain that happened in my life because pain shrinks perspective. How did Joseph do it? How did Joseph let go of all the stuff that was done to him and say, this is going to be a part of my story, but it's not the only thing in my story. It's helping to make me who I am, but it's not all of who I am. The victory of your life is your contribution. That's what Joseph sees. Hey, a lot of stuff's happened to me, and God's done a lot of stuff with it, but the value of my life, regardless of what's happened or what's going to happen, is what's given. What does my life do for people? What does my life give to God? What does my life give to the kingdom? It is God's desire that you are filled and satisfied to the point of sharing. Filled up so much that you're overflowing. And so that when people come around you, they are not sucked into the, the dry sponge of a painful moment. You are overflowing because you've been satisfied and filled. They get soaked in the overflowing of your satisfaction. Who is this young preacher with such conviction? I remember hearing that one time. I remember hearing that. This guy came up there and he just started preaching. He's from Cambodia. And nobody had heard him preach before. And there was just a fire in the man. And I knew where that conviction came from. Because one time I sat with him and he told me that even though his family wasn't Christian, when he became Christian in Cambodia, he felt that he had to preach. In fact, they renamed him Titus, young preacher. And he would stand and he would quietly preach into a mirror, hoping that his dad wouldn't open the door, trying to practice and get ready for the call that God had put on his life. The pain of being the only Christian in a home and not having the support of his family and practicing it into a mirror had developed in him not bitterness and focus on, I'm going to show my dad. I'm a preacher with conviction. I practiced in the least likely places I practiced my craft, and I'm ready to preach to these people, and they preached with conviction. What about a young man that I met? His name is Shafiq. And you meet him and think, this is a guy who, he seems like he is 65 years old, has been through all kinds of stuff in life. He has got the grit and determination. He's a man of integrity. Where did that come from? How did he get that? It came from his unfavorable story that he was the only Christian in a Muslim home, that his dad brought in the imam to confront him and say, make a choice right now, son. You are either with us or you're not with us. And he said, I'm a man of God. Now you get a 20-something-year-old man who behaves like a war-torn, thick skin, I'm ready to take on the world kind of a Christian leader. Not focused on, I'm gonna show them, this is what was done to me, this isn't fair. It's my story gives me value. I can now do something I couldn't do because in harm was intended to me, but God used it for my good. And now I can give to others. What about you? Who is this person that you are? 
all that you've been through, everything that's been against you, some of it you wrote into your own story. Some of it you didn't want that was written in before you ever had a chance. Some of it wasn't fair, but you have it. You don't need to forget it. God doesn't want to forget it. He wants to use it. He wants to make it a part of the story for what's going to be accomplished right now. Not some super egotistical drama that's going to be built up in your life, but a healthiness, a healthiness of overflowing so that now I'm not just consumed in where I've been, I am fulfilled in where I am and I'm ready to pour into you. We're going to sing together. I want you to stand and repeat after me. Here's the sentence you're going to repeat. Not yet. Just go ahead and stand. I'm going to read the sentence. I want to give you just kind of let your wheels turn. No matter what happened, is happening, or will happen, there will be a victory. Repeat after me. No matter what happened, is happening, or will happen, there will be a victory. 